Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Beasley Allen webinar, Consumer Fraud and Commercial Litigation, How to Spot a Case. My name is David Byrne, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker panel for this very important litigation topic. Today, my partners, D. Miles, Rebecca Gilliland, Clay Barnett, Leon Hampton, and Lance Gould will provide us a guide to identifying and vetting potential fraud and consumer litigation cases. While we're waiting on the last of our registrants to join us, let's take a few moments to meet our five speakers. D. Miles is the longtime head of Beasley Allen's Consumer Fraud and Commercial Litigation Section. Throughout his career, D. has been a national leader in these types of cases, and his work has produced numerous record-setting verdicts for clients across the country. D. handles every type of case in the section, but today he'll be speaking with us about class action litigation and specifically what lawyers need to look for when vetting these potential class actions. Rebecca Gilliland serves as an attorney in our consumer fraud section, and she practices out of our mobile office. Rebecca has worked on a variety of cases, including representing attorneys general in litigation, which sought to recover millions of dollars lost by state Medicaid agencies as a result of fraudulent practices in the healthcare industry. She's currently working on an antitrust MDL case against Blue Cross Blue Shield, as well as several class actions, including many of our auto defect class actions. Rebecca will be speaking with us today about the different types of class action cases we're handling at Beasley Allen and why knowing what to look for when vetting potential class cases is so important. Next, Clay Barnett, another principal in the Beasley Allen Consumer Fraud and Commercial Litigation section. Clay works out of our Atlanta office, and for many years, Clay has pursued pharmaceutical companies for fraud committed against various state governments. Currently, though, Clay specializes in vehicle and equipment defect class action litigation, where he successfully represented plaintiffs against some of the country's biggest auto manufacturers. Today, Clay will talk with us about his recent class action jury trial against General Motors a case that resulted in a $102.6 million verdict. Next, we'll hear from Leon Hampton. Leon is also serving as a principal in our consumer fraud and commercial litigation section. Leon specializes in QUITAM whistleblower litigation, workers' compensation claims, sexual assault cases, and various types of employment litigation. Leon was a member of the trial team that recently recovered $14.7 million for a whistleblower in the Northern District of Alabama. He'll be speaking with us today about sexual assault and employment cases and what you need to know to be successful with these claims. And last but not least, Lance Gould joins us today, another distinguished partner in our fraud and commercial litigation section. Over the past 25 years, Lance has helped thousands of Beasley Allen clients and he's produced numerous multi-million dollar settlements. Lance primarily focuses on whistleblower litigation, attorney general litigation, and class action cases. He'll be speaking with us today about QUITAM cases, what they are, and how to know whether you may have one in your current case list. So before I turn the program over to our speakers, I need to go over a few CLE-related notes. First and foremost, today's webinar has been approved by the Alabama and Georgia State Bars for one hour of CLE credit. In order to receive full credit for attending, you've got to stay on for the duration of the program. A link to today's presentation was included in the Zoom confirmation email you should have received when you registered for this webinar. But by the end of this week, you'll receive another email with a certificate of attendance and an updated presentation and video link. You can email that completed evaluation form to webinars at BeasleyIsland.com. This webinar is being recorded, and for those Alabama and Georgia attorneys participating by phone, I'd ask that you please email your name, your phone number, and your state bar ID number to webinars at BeasleyIsland.com so that we can ensure you receive full CLE credit. For those of you practicing in states other than Alabama and Georgia, we'll send you a certificate of attendance that you can present to your own state bar. Also, be sure to check out the events page of our website, BeasleyIsland.com slash events, as we're going to be adding more webinars throughout the year and again next year. 
Finally, if you have questions during today's webinar, I want to encourage you to use the question and answer feature located at the bottom of your screen. We're going to set aside time at the end of today's program to try and tackle your questions, all of the questions submitted by our viewers. So with that, Dee, Rebecca, Clay, Leon, and Lance, let's get started. Thank you, David. First of all, I want to welcome everybody uh, to this webinar and appreciate you sharing your time with us and uh, giving us an opportunity to share some really good information uh, with you about class actions. It looks like we got about somewhere between 300 and 400 people on here. Um, and that is, uh, that is impressive. So, wow, thank you for joining us. So I want to talk to you uh, about how to designate uh, that you have maybe a class action sitting in the chair across from you in your office. And I'm going to go through a, a few of these uh, in just a moment, but I want to preliminary mention two things. One, um, the first thing that you need to know we're going to look at when we are looking at these um, class actions to see whether or not they're viable, is I'm going to want to know if there's an arbitration clause in any type of contract. Because most of these class actions, consumer class actions, involve some type of an agreement. And, and we need to look at that to find out if there's an arbitration clause in it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that later, but I wanted to go ahead and get that out first because that's the first thing we do. We ask for your documents, and then we look and We'll go over the things that we look for. And I don't want anyone to think just because there's an arbitration clause in there, that's the end of our analysis, because it's not. There are several things that we'll look at to determine whether or not there's a way around that particular arbitration clause or whether or not um, we could bring it to um, maybe an attorney general. So let me get to the class actions, because when you bring class action to us, an idea, and I, I welcome any ideas, uh, there is no dumb idea when you're looking at classes. Um, and, and once we get over the arbitration part of it, and we, we determine that, well, maybe there's not an arbitration problem, then we're going to look at these things that you see on the list. Now, these are things you all saw in law school, uh, but I want to give you the practical part of it. What are we looking at we look for these things? The first thing you want to look at is you want to see whether or not the conduct of the person in your office is complaining about is pretty uniform. Like, for example, and, and, uh, Clay is going to talk about this a little more, and even Rebecca. But in the case we just got a verdict on, that was a case involving a car uh, known as an LC9. It was a 5.3 liter engine of General Motors. Everybody who owned one of those had this same problem. It was a, a problem with the rings not being proper in the engine, and it caused oil consumption, excessive oil consumption. That's a case where everybody has the same problem. And that's the kind of thing that we're looking for uh, initially is, is the conduct the same? Is the harm basically the same to everybody? So we want to look at that. That's typical and that's common. Uh, there's a slight difference between the two, but the, for our purposes of, of talking about how to spot, that's basically what we're looking for. It's just some uniform type of conduct. The next thing you want to look for is whether or not the claim that is being brought by your client is pretty typical of what everybody else's claim would be. Now, um, that also involves who is the plaintiff. Um, you know, you don't want a plaintiff who's been a serial plaintiff in classes, someone who's there all the time, who files them all the time. It's not a good representative. Judges will throw those out. You don't really want anybody in bankruptcy. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a way around that, sometimes not. But generally speaking, it's not a good um, good plaintiff, not a good representative to bring. Um, and and the second, uh, another thing is, is you don't want somebody who's perhaps in prison, which we've had that problem before, or uh, maybe they're out and they've uh, come forward with this claim. You know, they're, they're not going to serve the class well. Judges are going to toss them for various reasons. Um, and, and, and you want somebody who just doesn't have any general bad behavior. And the things you got to look for there in a new world is what are they saying on social media? You got to look at those things before you say, well, that's a good plaintiff or that's a bad plaintiff. In fact, in the case we just had, that was an issue that came up. It wasn't harmful, but it's something we got to look at and prepare for. And it's certainly not something that would eliminate a plaintiff as being a class representative. But those are some of the things that we're looking for initially. Um, now, you want to look at damages because the damages, sometimes people think, oh, well, the damages are different for everybody. So if they're different for everybody, well, maybe, you know, that's not a class. That's wrong. It is a class because damages are probably going to be different. For example, we had two cases recently they were both certified, one for Banner Life, one for USFL. They were both insurance cases, and it had to do with um, 
a company that went into the policy and changed the cost of insurance rate. They did so illegally because they didn't have any real basis to do it, but they did it. But it was a percentage change. So you just carried that percentage over to what each policyholder's damages were, and it was just a percentage of their of their cost of insurance. So it was the same, but the actual damage amount was different. So you shouldn't overlook that, you know, we, it's one of the things we have to look carefully at because even sometimes when you have those damages, like for example, in, in the case we had with General Motors, those damages were exactly the same for everybody, $2,700 per car. Well, that brings me to my next point. Um, you also want to look at the damages as not being too large because it's got to almost be a case that you would never file on its own. Like in General Motors, it was a $2,700 per car. I'm not going to file that. You're not going to file that. Uh, it'd be a small claims court case. But in a class where everybody had the same problem, that's a great case. And so you see that a lot. So when you see those people who come in and say, oh, well, I lost $50 on this. And you think, well, I'm not, I'm not taking that. I'm not interested in that. Call us because it may be a case. Maybe it's something we want to look at. And the last thing I want to talk about before I turn it over to Rebecca is you know, ascertainability, it has to be, that's a fancy word for it. You just have to be able to identify the class. You have to be able to find those plaintiffs that will, that will make it fit the class definition. For example, if you go to a grocery store and you buy a bottle of olive oil, it's hard to determine who is in that class. But you, if you have a person like in an automobile defect, like we've been talking about with General Motors, well, there's a VIN number. That's easy to identify because uh, the company's going to know exactly what that car is if he has it. So ascertainability is something that we have to worry about, but that's something we're looking at. It's just something I want to put in your mind when you're thinking about sending us a case or calling us. That's one of the things that we want to look at. Um, I, I talked a minute ago about how there's slight differences in damages, and there's sometimes there's slight differences in these other things. But one of the things we have to look at is, you know, there's a predominance requirement. And that basically means is the good of the class uh, does it, is it, is it um, outweigh any individual issues? And most of the time you run, on, run up on that with damages. <clears throat> we can almost always overcome that with good arguments that have been developed, especially in the 11th Circuit. So those are a few things that right off the bat we're going to take a look at. And I'm going to ask Rebecca to talk a little bit more, but uh, the two things I want to come back to, with Rebecca, are arbitration and also want to talk about the type of cases we're taking. So with that, let me turn that over to you. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, so one of the other things that we look for kind of in part of our initial assessment that you might not consider when you've got a client coming in and they tell you their story, um, you might think like Dee mentioned, it's a $50 case. Maybe it's not something that you're going to take on an individual basis, but we can turn it into a class if we can show it's the result of a pattern or practice. Um, this comes up quite a bit actually in insurance cases, for example. There may be an internal policy or it's a habit of the company to always act in a certain way. It's a little bit, you know, it's difficult to find that smoking gun document that says always deny every claim type of thing, but it does happen. Or sometimes um, you may remember law school cases, they were discrimination cases about motorcycle police officers and that the, that disparate impact that wasn't necessarily intended. But if the policy is written so that it always creates a certain result, that can be a pattern of practice. So that might be something that we could also turn into a class action. Um, we also do a lot of consumer protection type cases, like Dee mentioned, and those often arise in deceptive advertising or marketing. Um, so the Consumer Protection Act in pretty much every state has a general catch-all that says anything unfair or deceptive that deals with consumer marketing, basically. But they also sometimes have a specific list of things that are um, almost per se a violation of the statute. And one of those is advertising something to have characteristics that it doesn't actually have. Uh, so if you come across something like that, where there's specific marketing that is broadly sent out to all consumers, where, you know, there's a there's a, a federal case pending another vehicle case where um, I think it's the Mustang was marketed to be able to be track ready. You know, you could take it out and race it, um, but it turns out it can't. So that actually might also fall under a deceptive advertising or marketing claim because that marketing material is telling consumers this vehicle has certain characteristics, but it turns out it doesn't actually. Um, so the next bullet point on here is 
broad impact. And that kind of goes back to some of the things that Dee was saying. And it's one of those first four concerns that are on one of the earlier slides. And that goes towards numerosity. Uh, you want to make sure that your class size is not going to be 10 people. Um, that's not going to get certified. That's the type of case that you would bring as a multi-plaintiff complaint instead of a class. So the numerosity requirement and having a broad impact kind of go hand in hand. We want to make sure that we've got enough class members that not only does it financially make sense to bring it as a class, but it also is going to that's one of the requirements under the rules. You have to show that it is basically um, more efficient for all the parties. Um, it's easier to manage the case if to bring it as a group instead of as a bunch of individual claims. So when we're, we're looking for broad impact, um, that's one of the reasons why I personally like the deceptive advertising and marketing claims because you don't typically have a targeted marketing that's only going to 10 people. You know, you think of a, a radio ad or a commercial or a flyer even in print. Um, those aren't narrowly produced. They are sent out very broadly. So that's the type of thing that we're looking for is you want it to be more than just five, 10 people. Uh, there's not actually a set number that's required. Uh, one of our preferences is to be in the 100 range, but if you've got high enough damages and it's a slightly smaller class, it still might work. Um, so there, there's no real set number that you absolutely have to meet. It's just a hundred is a good number. Anything bigger than that, it might be possible. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is classified damages and Dee kind of covered this a good bit on the earlier slide. And so there's a difference between like Dee described, there's a difference between your individual damages being different, but they have to be similar. So what we're looking at, uh, if you take it back to a deceptive marketing, um, sometimes the damages on that are a little bit difficult to identify, but Juul is kind of a good example. Let's talk about marketing to children. The damages from that, we're not talking about the personal injury side of the damages. We're talking about the fact that a, a minor purchased something that they shouldn't have had access to. So your damages in that case might be the, the cost, the actual literal cost that was paid for something they shouldn't have had. Or maybe something was touted to have a certain characteristic and it doesn't, but you paid more expecting it to have those characteristics. So these damages questions are generally expert driven, um, especially in a situation like that where we're talking about the overpayment, the extra money that you paid because you expected it to have a certain quality that it doesn't have. But those types of damages models would apply to everyone in the class. So everyone that received the marketing and purchase the vehicle, for example, based on the expectation that it had certain qualities and did not, they all overpaid by, you know, some amount. That's enough for it to be considered classified damages. You might have an individual calculation on somebody paid $10 more, somebody paid $15 more, something like that, but that doesn't defeat class certification. They're just all impacted in the same way. One of the other things you want to look for is what type of relief your clients are looking for. Um, injunctive cases exist uh, in the class action world. Damages cases are a little bit easier, to be honest. Um, if you have a damages model that applies class-wide, you know, everybody overpaid by a certain percent, or everybody purchased something expecting it to have characteristics it didn't, um, that's, that's money damages. That's a little bit easier to certify. Injunctive relief is a little bit more difficult because part of what you're looking for in those types of claims and an equitable claim is uh, for the defendant to stop doing something. Now you can still get that. And a lot of times we have that interwoven in some of the cases that we bring. So you might ask for the tip to marketing, for example, um, to stop advertising it as having those certain characteristics that it doesn't. So you're asking for injunctive relief, but you're also asking for money damages because you overpaid for a product. So a lot of times they go hand in hand um, and we like the ones where it's dual. We like it when it's got both. Um, we do bring injunctive relief classes, but they are a little bit more difficult to get certified. Generally money damages is kind of an easier concept for everyone, even judges to get behind. So we look for those, um, but don't rule it out if it's an injunctive relief case. Uh, still, we'd love to take a look at it. So the next thing that we're going to talk about, and Dee and I are going to kind of share this one a little bit, is different types of class actions that we handle. Um, and that's not to say that this is going to be an exclusive list. If you think you have a class theory, like Dee said, we like to take a look at anything. Um, I always joke with the, the people in our section that I'm 
I'm kind of the nerd. So if you have a strange question and you, you just think you have a strange idea, I would love to hear about it. Um, but right now, what we're really focusing on, we have a very large automobile defect section. And Clay is going to talk about that in a minute because that's become sort of its own little niche area within our class action litigation. Uh, we also do a good bit of insurance litigation, and Dee mentioned some life insurance cases a little bit ago, and I think he's going to talk a little bit more about those in a minute. But there's, for when it comes to insurance cases, you just need to be aware that there's two different types. There's ERISA and non-ERISA. So ERISA is basically um, an insurance policy that's provided from an employer, but it can also be a retirement benefit that's provided from an employer. You've probably all seen articles about overpaying for management or um, not offering the appropriate um, investment opportunities. So those would be, um, those are also types of litigations that we look at. And then we have a securities, which is sometimes thought of as being a subset of retirement, but it's not necessarily. So securities classes can be brought by uh, against a, a business. You know, they make um, false statements in their filings to the SEC, for example, that could be a residual securities case. Or if it can also we had a securities ERISA case, so they were sort of both lumped in together where it was dealing with an ERISA investment in securities, but in the securities of that business. So there's a lot of overlap between securities and the insurance litigation world. Um, and then I already talked about consumer protection a little bit. Um, Dee mentioned that we do some attorney general representation as well as doing class actions. So when you're looking at a consumer protection case, we often kind of assess it as both. And then we'll meet together and try and figure out which one do we think is going to get us get the most relief for the consumers. Is it going to be through an attorney general representation or is it best brought as a class action? So there's a lot of factors that go into um, kind of fleshing that out to see how we want to handle it. Um, Dee, I think you also wanted to mention a couple of the other types of class actions that we look at. Oh, your volume isn't working right now, Dee. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> so I know that he wanted to mention some of the insurance specifically. Um, we have had a couple of class actions that have been successful. They've been settled. Some of them are still in process dealing with cost of insurance. Um, those cases, you know, when you're when a carrier is setting the cost of your premiums, it's often based on um, what they call the cost of insurance. So they might have an increase over time. And but there's only certain factors that they're actually allowed to make those changes on. And oftentimes they're contained within the policy language itself. So um, we do look at those types of cases as well. Um, and then, of course, Clay is going to talk in a minute about some of the auto defect cases in a lot more detail. So one of the other things, this is why we wanted to give this information. Um, this is why it matters when you've got an initial intake coming in and you're trying to decide, is this an individual case that I want to take? Is this a class that I might want to refer? Um, so we talked about the different types of damages, the, the injunctive or the monetary relief. So you need to be able to identify that. Um, you have to know what relief they're after. Um, and then Dee mentioned arbitration clauses. So arbitration clauses, you know, they're not the end all of a case. Um, we do have actually cases at arbitration right now. We have one that we recently filed where we're representing a physician group and it relates to their the billing practices of a third party that they hired. Um, but one of the things that we do look for very strongly in arbitration clauses is going to be that class waiver. So the arbitration clause itself, it, we might be able to get around it. Um, it might be void. We might be able to argue to the court successfully or to the arbitrator, depending on who has that authority making power there, that it shouldn't be enforced. Or maybe there are non-parties to the contract, like in our vehicle cases that, that Clay can talk about in a little bit. A, a lot of times there's arbitration provisions when you go purchase a new vehicle, but they might only be between the dealership and the purchaser. So there's sometimes ways to get around that. And then the other thing we need to look for and is the, the type of cause of action we're going to bring. Is this a breach of contract? Is it a breach of warranty? Is it a consumer protection place, case? And one of the reasons that that is so important is we want to make sure that we're choosing causes of action and that we can bring causes of action that don't are not going to defeat class certification. And reliance is specifically on here because that's one of the big issues when we're looking at class certification. That might make it 
um, not to be a common question of law or fact. Did each individual rely upon representations that were made to them? So we always want to pay attention to those when we're looking at the causes of action that we might bring. Um, so now I want to introduce Clay. Um, David already introduced him to you, and he's going to talk very specifically about the GM jury trial that we just had out in San Francisco, but he's also going to talk a little bit more broadly about how we look at vehicle cases to begin with. So, Clay? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, hello, everybody. I'll, I'll talk to you about a trial that we just um, put on and won in San Francisco. Uh, we started on September 19th and finished on the 4th. Um, this actually was my very first automotive defect theory that came to me back in 2016. Um, as uh, David mentioned, I was a, I prosecuted um, pricing fraud for years uh, before shifting into really is what my specialty is, and that's um, mechanical defects or product defects that we do on a class level. So these are economic based, they're not injury based, but if someone has a vehicle, a, a tractor or a boat or a consumer item that uh, is failing for some reason and not failing in a, in an insignificant way, but in a material way that affects its operation, makes it unusable, makes it dangerous, makes it um, essentially unfit. It's unfit for its design. That's where we can file a class. Now, how did that happen in this one that got us a jury verdict? It involved an engine. It involved an engines and GM SUVs and pickup trucks. The theory came to me from a lawyer in Birmingham. He said, look, these, these Tahoes and, and Silverados are, are tearing themselves up very early uh, in their lifespan. Of course, I think everybody understands that nowadays these vehicles will run well past 150, 200,000 miles without needing major overhaul uh, work. And by that, I mean an engine replacement or a big time engine repair. Um, and these particular engines weren't making it past 75,000. They happen to be warranty for out to 100,000 miles in five years. And that is what um kind of kicked off the kicked off the class which is gm believe those engines ought to go out to at least a hundred thousand miles or five years because it, it warranted them for such length yet the product wasn't doing that it wasn't even living up to its own warrant so that right there is a prima facie or that is a great way of, of identifying a product defect from a class action economic law standpoint so why don't we just talk about the trial itself and I'll narrow it down to our trial strategy versus GM's trial strategy and how ours uh, won the day. Judge Chen out in the Northern District of California is a highly respected district judge out there. He has an enormous caseload, but he managed to squeeze us in. Um, he's, so, he's so busy that he cuts off his trial days at 1.30 in the afternoon in order to hear motion the whole emotion docket after that. He also cut, uh, doesn't um, allow trial to go forward on Thursdays because those are emotion docket days uh, dedicated. So with that in mind, he gave each side um, 15 hours to present its testimony and arguments. He gave us eight trial days. We used seven of those. Well, that fit into our trial strategy well because we knew that we could lose the jury if we got into details. Instead, we needed to show our best evidence, and not our not just the good evidence. In fact, it's all all of us have the challenge of picking and choosing among among these documents. We so godly. This is this email has a has a terrific discussion about the defect. The, the, the engineers are discussing what to do about it. Yet. It doesn't really inform a jury on, on, a, on a high level. It's just too detailed. So one of my recommendations, because it worked here, is when you've got a document that's just good, put it in one stack. And then have another stack for the great documents, because the great documents are the ones that you could look at, immediately understand what it's discussing and what value it brings and what element it brings. So 
Judge Chen helped us uh, with his with his very restricted time uh, clock for for trial. In fact, he actually kept a running game clock down to the minute. Um, and so, how did we work within that framework? What we did was we put on our our liability expert is almost a neutral. He was not. Uh, he was anything but a hired hitman. He came across as an instructor, as a professor, as a as a as a learned intermediary on the subject matter of combustion engines. It didn't hurt that he was the Air Force's chief scientist. It didn't hurt that he's been a mechanical engineer for uh, forty years. That he's taught thousands of engineering students. All of those things, all of those traits, made him more uh, credible. But I think what made the what really sealed him up in terms of uh, being the, the the witness that we wanted him to be is that he did not focus fire on GM, but instead put his put his focus on teaching the jury about how an engine operates, and then what happens if it's missing certain components or or, or conditions, and if it is, if certain conditions are not present. By conditions, I mean things like adequate oil supply. What happens to the engine? And what parts will then fail? Well, when he laid out that high-level discussion about engine operation, things that uh, elements that an engine must have to operate in a healthy and reliable manner, and then what happens when, when an engine is starved of those elements? Well, that happened to line up with our theory. And so at the end of my directive, uh, Dr. John, I just asked him, let's just talk about things when, when we start, when some of these elements start to drop out. Can you tell the jury what what the result would be? If he gave those results to the jury. They happened to be the story that uh, of these GM engines. Now, that was not our approach. Put him on as almost a neutral, but mainly as a tutor. What did GM come along and do? They just read from the expert cross examination playbook and they attacked. About the first thing out of their mouth was, "You get paid a lot of money to come in here, don't you?" And I looked over at the jury, and the jury was like, "That was not. That was that was a that was too aggressive. From what they were not ready for it. Um, they didn't like it. It just seemed like she had brought, you know, a gun to a fist fight. The, the GM lawyer. So that was the tone that was set right out of the gate. GM came across far too aggressively on a witness who was in no way a paid advocate, even though." That's what he was. He was a paid advocate. He just didn't come across that way by design. We put on GM's engineers in adverse directs. Now, what that did was that just created a gigantic impeachment show because we had their emails, we had their internal discussions, we had their discussions with their suppliers, all manner of of, of the frenzied activity that they uh, conducted to try to get around the defect and try to cure the defect without actually curing it. Well, there were, as you can imagine, there were a great deal of admissions in there. There were a great deal of high-level statements made in those emails that a jury could have read on its own and said, I know what that engineer is talking about, and that's an admission. Well, guess what they, those engineers did when they were came in on the stand? They, they tried to walk back their own statements. Well, they... These engineers had, had had affirmed those statements in deposition, so we had that ready for uh, for impeachment. Then at trial, they they go back and say, "Well, don't don't believe what you're reading on the paper. Don't believe what I said in deposition in 2019. Believe what I have to say about it now." After my lawyers have flown me all the way from Detroit to San Francisco, sit in this chair and try to muddy the water. Now, I think the thing that we did. And Rebecca for sure falls into this category very well is, is that we conducted surgical and professional impeachment. We did not use this, a scorched earth approach with those witnesses, but instead we were polite. We were, um, we, we, kept, we kept our composure. We did not jump on the witness when some lawyers just can't can't stop themselves from doing that. You have to let the witness hang himself. Don't come after him with the aggression that makes you potentially the bad guy. So we were determined not to do that, and we succeeded. Um, 
we found that our video evidence, our video deposition evidence was moderately effective. Um, I think we all need to be careful about how much we depend on video testimony. I can tell you that we became, we were given a great gift by GM and the judge pre-trial, and that is we went in with a video prepared uh, case in chief because the witnesses were outside of subpoena power. GM said, oh, no, 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 we're bringing these guys that you deposed back in 2019 and who you have up against the wall in your, in your, uh, in your video deposition. And we, and we said, no, we would rather take advantage of the fact that we have this deposition. It's a bird in the hand. We know what the witnesses are going to say. They're outside of subpoena power. We can't bring them in, call them into court. But we don't know that we can truly rely on you to bring them here when, to California when you save them. Well, the judge said to us, uh, no, plaintiffs, you're not going to play a deposition when that, when that individual is sitting right here in the courtroom or is outside the courtroom. No, what you'll do is you'll call that witness live. You'll be, be a lawyer, do what you're paid to do, and uh, take your chances there, which we did. That turned out to be a tremendous benefit to us because we got to see how our adverse direct looked compared to our video. Our video at the time we thought was excellent, but you just looking back on it, you could tell the impact was made through the adverse directs. Of course, the adverse directs set us up for GM's strongest weapon, which was they put on their case in chief and our case in chief. Anytime we had a GM engineer in the, on the box, GM came along and ran a full direct examination of that witness right after we had conducted adverse direct. All right, this is where the trial strategies differ. We're at, I think ours, again, was the smarter and more effective strategy. We were lean, we were direct, we used the best evidence we had. GM's lawyers, excellent lawyers, very, very deep talent pool on that team. They could not resist the urge to go too long. They just went too long with their witnesses. And as a result, the damage they did got washed away with some of the, with the bland testing. They were trying to tell a story for each witness, only they couldn't tell it in a short enough period in the most in a, in a concise enough way that the jury not miss some of their big points. The, uh, that brings me to Rebecca. Rebecca had, uh, did a terrific job with one of their warranty guys, which was essentially the GM defense, which is, this is a this is annoyance. This is not a defect. We, we issue warranties for a reason, because we know there will be parts that fail, and therefore we warranty them. We warranty them. Well, that guy got on the stand after, after uh, Rebecca adverse directed him and blew us to bits with a, with a fabricated failure rate number. It's a number that we've never seen before. It's a number that made our case, our theory, appear to be complete junk. I mean, if you believe GM's number, there's no way you can believe the plaintiff's number. Um, so fortunately for us, that witness uh, ended the day still on direct from GM. Rebecca was able to prepare an adverse redirect for him. And we worked on that thing for hours and hours that afternoon and that night. She came in there. Undid the damage. That was our, I would say that for sure was, was the most treacherous part of the trial. It was where GM could have uh, zeroed us out and Rebecca actually diffused the bomb and got us back on track. Now, the takeaways that I found which, that are worth sharing with this group is are teach your jury about the actual product. That's at, that is at issue. Understand the product that is, that's at issue. Bring an example of that product that's at issue and put it in as a piece of evidence. We did that. We used a piston and rings with almost every single uh, witness that was on the stand after we introduced it. And then the jury knew when they went to the jury room, they actually knew the component that was failing because they could hold it in their hand. Um, the, the GM engineers weren't ready for that because it hadn't been done in deposition. They knew that they were holding the, the defective product in their hand and there wasn't much they could do about it. It's, it's tough. It's like 
the defendant being on the, going on the stand on a criminal case and you put the gun in his hand. So use actual evidence. The, the final point I'll say is what we did was we focus grouped this theory. We focus grouped it with about a dozen different focus groups. Again, this case was tried in San Francisco. So that jurisdiction was comprised of a ton of educated people. We found that we needed an educated jury to make sure they don't fall for GM's shenanigans and misdirection. As a result, we had an accountant, we had two, we had a small business owner, we had two software engineers. I mean, typically, we don't want an engineer on a product defect jury. But those got one of those product def- one of those engineers wound up being our foreman, our foreman. So do your due diligence on who it is you need in the jury box before you try one of these cases. And the focus group definitely did the work for us there. Um, I'm, glad, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. I'm, I'm going to wrap up here and hand it off to Leon. Thank you. Good morning. I'm happy to be with you all on this webinar this morning. Um, in addition to being a part of the key town litigation team here in the fraud section, I also prosecute sexual assault cases in state court, as well as employment discrimination cases under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in federal court. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about how to spot a good sexual assault case. And then later, we'll talk about how to spot an employment discrimination um, case under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So over 41% of women in the U.S. have experienced some uh, form of sexual violence, whether that's sexual assault or rape. And surprisingly enough, or maybe it's not as surprising, is that a lot of these sexual assaults um, does not do not get reported. Um, just the nature of the crime um, and the offense, many of the victims um, don't feel safe coming forward and actually voicing uh, what happened to them. Most of the time when we think about sexual assault cases, we think in the criminal context because, um, of course, it is a crime to um, uh, sexually assault someone, of course, or rape them. But in addition to the criminal uh, claim that a victim may have against um, the perpetrator, they also have a civil claim against that perpetrator. And the great thing about those claims is that they can be filed in state court under a simple um, civil assault or battery. Uh, claim. And, and these, of course, are very straightforward claims that you can bring in your in your state court. Under Alabama law, there are three things that you must show that that the defendant touched the plaintiff, uh, that they intended to touch the plaintiff, and that that touching was offensive uh, or harmful. And so if you have those, meet those elements, then of course, you can bring those claims against the uh, perpetrator. These are very sensitive cases, and the victims often are fragile, And so in the initial intake, it's very important that you gain a rapport um, with that victim. Um, And that may look like going to their house, going to their um, office or calling them into the office and sitting them down and just allowing them to talk and tell their story without um, butting in or trying to get some of the probing questions that you need out in that initial meeting. Um, Generally, you allow them to talk, get the story out and write down your more probing questions and call them in for a second meeting and then go into those more sensitive areas. But in order to to start getting grooming a good plaintiff in in the sense of uh, getting them ready to tell their story in front of a jury, you you want them to get all of the emotions out and just let them tell their story without um, jumping in in there in that initial meeting. So let's let's go to the next slide. 38% 38% of women and 14% of men um, have reported experience in some form of sexual violence in the workplace context. And so I want to talk to you briefly about how do you hold an employer liable for the sexual assault committed by the employee, All right? So this happened in the context where you have an employee who was assaulted by a coworker. Right. Of course, you have a civil claim of assault and battery against the coworker, but you may also have a better claim or a, a uh, more lucrative claim against the employer if you can show that the employer were, was either negligent or wanton in their hiring, training, and/or supervision of the perpetrator. 
um, if you can sh have evidence of that, then you can bring a negligent one hiring training in our supervision claim against the employer. Or if the um, employer actually ratified the actions of the perpetrator after the fact. So this is a very fact-driven analysis. And what you want to know is what did the employer know? When did they know it? And what did they do after they knew it, right? And so you want to get those questions to your victim. Did you tell anyone uh, what happened? Right? When did you tell them? And what happened after you told the, the employer? If you find that the employer knew about the sexual assault, the offensive touching, or if they knew about uh, comments that had been made to the victim before the actual uh, sexual assault or rape happened, then you can possibly bring a claim for a um, negligent want and hiring training or supervision against that employee. Next slide, please. So under Alabama law, an employee can be held liable for the sexual violence of his employee if the employer ratifies the employee's unlawful acts. Um, an employer ratifies an act when one, it expressly adopts the employee's behavior or it implicitly approves the behavior. So after the victim um, notified the employer of the, the action, the wrongful conduct, you want to look at what did the employer do? Did they do an investigation? Did they um, do interviews? Did they go back and look at cameras? What was the conclusion of, of that investigation? Did they hold the perpetrator responsible by terminating that person, moving them to another facility? Uh, what did they do after they had knowledge? If the answer is nothing, uh, then you have a very good claim against the employer for ratifying the uh, actions of the underlying tort fees. An employee's failure to stop the tortious conduct after it learns of the conduct will support an inference that the employer tolerated the conduct. I, I have here the Weinstein Company and USA Gymnastics. In both of those cases, uh, the company was well aware of the tort feasors' actions. And instead of holding them responsible, they continue to allow those individuals to operate in their capacity. And in doing so, they were allowed to continue to perpetrate these crimes against their victims. Next slide. So let's move to um, how to spot an employment discrimination claim. Of course, Title VII C Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits employers from discriminating against an employee or prospective employee on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, or religion. These are called protected classes. Um, and so if an employee fit uh, within one of these protected classes and they feel they have been discriminated against on the basis of one of these protected classes, then they may have a um, employment discrimination claim under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So the first step in uh, prosecuting an employment discrimination claim is filing a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC. Um, in order to get your claim into federal court, you must first file this complaint with the EEOC. If you do not file the complaint with the EEOC and go straight to federal court, that case will be dismissed for your failure to exhaust your administrative remedies. Um, and you must file this complaint with the EEOC within 180 days from the last discriminatory act or adverse employment action um, from your employer. So let's say you were terminated and you feel the basis of your termination was on the basis of your religion or your race or your uh, gender, then you have 180 days from that last um, adverse employment action to file a complaint with the EEOC. If you fail to do that, then you lose any right to bring a case into the federal courts. If your state has a discrimination statute that is similar with similar remedies as Title VII, that uh, 180 days period is extended to 300 days um, from the last discriminatory act. Um, this is very important. This 180 days bar and this 300 uh, day bar is very important because the last thing you want is for an uh, a potential client to bring a case into your office and you sit on it for a while and then ultimately decide not to file the case. But while you were investigating the case, those 180 days or 300 days were running and, you know, you decide to turn the case down at day 100, you know, or day 120, 
And now the, the plaintiffs have less time to actually get their case uh, before the EEOC, and they could possibly lose their claim altogether. And so you want to make sure that you're investigating these cases as swiftly as possible. As soon as there is an employment discrimination case that come in, you want to take a look at it, make a decision uh, fairly quickly as to whether or not you will um, in, investigate further or represent that plaintiff with the EEOC, and then ultimately before the federal court. So once that complaint is filed with the EEOC, the EEOC typically will investigate the claim and they will make a determination as to whether or not they have found some basis of discrimination. Um, if they find basis of discrimination, they will uh, reach out to the employer and offer that the employer and the employee uh, go through a mediation process. If the employer decide they don't want to mediate the, the case, then EEOC will issue a right to sue letter to the plaintiff and they can bring their case into federal court. They have 90 days from the date of receipt of that right to suit letter to actually bring the case into federal court. The alternative is, is that the EEOC could determine that they find no basis of discrimination um, based on a protected class. In that scenario, they will still issue you a right to sue letter and you still have those 90 days to file a lawsuit in federal court. Um, if you don't file within those 90 days, that's your statute of limitation and it's forever barred from being able to file. So again, it's very important to make sure that once you get that right to sue letter, make a determination whether or not you are filing. If not, that claim um, statute is running uh, fairly quickly. Next slide. So what do you look for when vetting discrimination claims? The first thing you want to look for is adverse employment actions, um, terminations, demotions, loss of pay, loss of responsibility. Um, it's not enough that the plaintiff feel or the potential client feel that they've been treated wrong, but there's been no adverse employment action, i.e. they haven't been terminated, they haven't been demoted, um, they haven't lost any pay or responsibility. They just feel like they're not being treated right by, by their employer. That may not be the basis of, of an employment discrimination um, case. So you really want to get down into the weeds uh, factually of what did the plaintiff experience? Uh, why do they feel they experienced that? The other thing that is important is that you have to find a proper comparator within the um, employment context. This simply means that you have to look at your plaintiff, what protected class they are claiming, i.e., I feel I have adverse employment discrimination uh, because of my race. You have to look at what is the adverse employment action that was taken, and then look at a person that is outside of that plaintiff protected class and see whether or not they were treated differently for uh, the same action, all right? So if you have an employer who terminates an employee for uh, failure to uh, get to work on time. And your plaintiff need to find a, a another employee who's not within their protected class or a different protect, a, a different class and be able to show that this other um, employee didn't get to work on time as well, but they never received any adverse employment action. If you can't show a proper comparator, once you get in the federal court, um, the courts, of course, will throw your case out because you're not able to show uh, the desperate treatment based on uh, a protected class. Next slide. So doing this analysis, uh, this very intense factual analysis, you may determine that the adverse employment action is not based on the plan of protected class. Um, in some instances, your plaintiff could be experiencing personality com conflict. They could be experiencing nepotism. All those things may be wrong, but they're not necessarily actionable. Um, or they may be experiencing a, a situation where they have been going to their superiors complaining of the way the employer handles certain matters. Um, for example, let's say the employer is a defense contractor or they receive federal funds in some type of way. And the employee feel as if the employee is handling those federal funds in a way that's not prohibited by federal law. And they keep going to the employee saying, hey, we're doing this process wrong. This is not allowed. This is illegal. And ultimately, the employee get tired of the complaint and decide to terminate that employee. 
but you may not have a Title VII discrimination claim because it's not really based on a protected class. But you may have a whistleblower claim, which uh, Lance Gould will talk about in a moment. The employer could be terminating that person because they are um, highlighting some um, illegal activity as it relates to federal statutes and regulations that could put that company in financial jeopardy with the federal government. And so we've had instances um, here in the fraud section where individual come in, they think they have a great employment discrimination case, they sit down um, and they want to know, can they file a claim under um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act? And we start going through the factual scenario and realize, hey, you don't have an employment discrimination case under Title VII. Um, this is not based on race, color, religion, gender. This is actually based on the fact that you've been complaining about um, illegal uh, activities at the at the company, and then we get them into another um, area, which is key tam litigation, and that is blowing the whistle because of federal um, irregularities. And so, at this time, Lance Gu will talk to us about uh, key tam cases and what that looked like. More I think Leon, and as Leon said, a lot of times the whistleblower key camp cases come to us through individuals that aren't even aware that they may have a claim. Uh, key camp cases are commonly referred to as whistleblower cases. And whistleblowing in its simplest form is a, an employee is exposing his employer for conducting uh, or defrauding the government. There are several statutes that provide for whistleblower claim recovery of person uh, individual sharing in the recovery, such as IRS and SEC whistleblower provisions. But today I want to focus on the False Claims Act. Uh, just a real brief history, the False Claims Act has become the government's most powerful and effective tool for combating fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, it dates back to the Civil War and uh, fraud was rampant and President Lincoln he enacted the FCA to encourage private individuals to expose companies for defrauding the government. And to do so, he included the key tap provision, which allows the individuals to bring a lawsuit on behalf of the government and share in the recovery. At that time, the uh, whistleblower could share, uh, could receive up to 50% of the entire recovery. Currently, um, the whistleblower can receive up to 30%. Generally, what we see is the whistleblower is able to receive generally 15 to 25%, depending on their um, involvement in the case and the type of evidence that they bring to the case. So how do you establish liability under the False Claims Act? Um, first, let's be clear. The False Claims Act, the company has to be defrauding the federal government. For example, a hospital or doctor billing Medicaid and Medicare for services that they have not provided um, or upcharging those services. Um, or any company that contracts with uh, any branch of the military. Uh, they may be contracting to perform certain services and not abiding by the contract. So what you have is you'll have a company that knowingly present a false claim to the federal government. And one example would be, uh, we had a company who had contracted with one of the military bases to perform the repairs on all of their aircraft. The contract required that the, in making repairs, the company had to use original parts. However, the company was using aftermarket parts in order to save more money, that would be the profit, uh, off of the contract. So not only were they overbilling the government for uh, work, for parts and materials that were substandard, they were putting service members' lives at risk. And so that's why these, uh, especially in the military, you have very specific criteria for the types of material um, that have to be used. Um, another way of extending liability is a, where a company causes um, a false statement to be made or a false or fraudulent claim. And where this occurs is you have a company um, that contracts with the Air Force to build airplanes. 
that company in turn contracts with subcontractors to build certain parts of the uh, aircraft and would end up billing through the original contractor. So if the contractor uses, uh, doesn't use the type of material, um, or like some contracts, you have to buy American Act, where the company is saying, yeah, we're using all these American parts and really important parts from China uh, that are subpar, and they're not disclosing that. Well, the subcontract is the one that is committing the fraud. However, the contractor is actually submitting the false or fraudulent claim to the government. So generally, the contractor would not be held liable um, for the subcontractor's conduct unless they knew or had some involvement. But here, the subcontractor causes a false claim to be made. Um, in evaluating these type of cases, uh, like Leon said, we've had individuals come in and thought they were uh, being retaliated against uh, for some other reasons, but it was actually because they had reported the fraud. A uh, large majority of the false claims in that case of the whistleblower cases that have been filed were from individuals who actually reported the fraud. And the company did not do anything to correct that activity because they were making too much profit, didn't think they would ever get caught. And that's the beauty of the key tamper provision. Um, when these when employees try to do the right thing, now they have an outlet that the company will not in turn respond and put the problem to government. Uh, another thing is we see uh, employees come to us that have been involved in a non compete. We see this non compete agreement. They want to come and find out about the validity of it. We see that in pharmaceutical sales um, and also in some government I contracts. We've had Lance, yeah. Lance, I am so sorry to interrupt you, but we're coming up on the hour. I know you have a lot of great information to share, and I want to encourage our viewers to reach out to these panel members via email. Their emails will appear on the last slide, which is coming up now. I want you to write down those email addresses and send your questions, if you will, to our panel members. They will be more than happy to answer all of your questions. Uh, again, on behalf of all our viewers, I want to thank our speaker panel for this really thoughtful and thorough presentation. Um, please join us next month. Check out our webinars page at beasleyallen.com slash events.